Austin. Let's get this going here. All right. There we go. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. There we go. Hi, I'm Phil, and I've written a bunch of books. I'm here today to talk mostly about lessons from the most recent one, the visual organization. This is number six for me. When I'm not writing, I'm speaking and helping companies do more with technology. It's a bit of a busy world out there. And aside from Rush, I'm an enormous fan of the show Breaking Bad. Any Breaking Bad fans out there? I am the danger. Who's this guy? Anyone? Nobody. I guarantee that at least 50 of you send his company money every month. Netflix, Reed Hastings, yes. Reed Hastings is the CEO and co-founder of Netflix. He's a very smart cookie. And in previous books, like The Age of the Platform, I discuss how companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google generate and use tremendous amounts of information. I'm talking about petabytes. But one can make the argument that there's no bigger big data company out there than Netflix. And through this talk, I want to focus not so much on the entertainment industry, but on lessons that companies like Netflix have for all of you. Well, when I say Netflix is a big, big data company, don't take my word for it. Let's look at some data. Why is this not forwarding? There we go. Netflix sports roughly 48 million customers as of last quarter. Market cap of roughly $20 billion. And this is my favorite stat on all of Netflix. The company is responsible for nearly one-third of all US weeknight internet traffic. This is why net neutrality is such a big idea. Imagine if pipes cost different, roads were different. You wouldn't be paying $7.95 a month for Netflix, that's for sure. Now, when I spoke at Netflix on the new book, roughly a month ago, at Netflix, I made a mistake. For that one-third statistic, I said one-fifth. And probably within, oh, I don't know, about two seconds, 25 Netflix employees concurrently corrected me. So at Netflix, everybody knows about data. This isn't just about CDOs or certain executives. They live and breathe data. There literally are data visualizations on the wall at Netflix. It's quite the sight. Some more facts about Netflix. It is the single largest user of Amazon Web Services, AWS, greater than even Amazon itself. Now, relying so much on AWS is a bit of a double-edged sword. In other words, on the positive side, Netflix need not spend billions of dollars on data centers, right? Those aren't cheap. There is a downside, though. And does anyone remember what happened in, on Christmas Day of 2012? Well, it used to be that people would spend time with their families on Christmas Day, and evidently now people would rather watch Netflix. But Netflix was down through no fault of the company. There was a small technical glitch, which resulted in Netflix being down the entire day. And what do you do these days if Netflix doesn't work? You go to Twitter and Facebook and start venting. So needless to say, it started trending. But Netflix's focus really isn't on plumbing, right? Netflix would rather spend its time doing some different things, such as in, two, in September of 2013, the company became the first non-TV network to win an Emmy for House of Cards, and Aaron had mentioned that before. Netflix is, I would argue, changing the game in many ways that I'll talk about today. It's enabling millions of people to either cut the cord with their cable companies or never even use cable to begin with, along with services like Hulu, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with House of Cards, Netflix dropped about $100 million on 13 episodes without even seeing a pilot. Again. Netflix had the data to justify that decision, but this is hardly Netflix's first foray into original content. Orange is the New Black, Lilyhammer. So Netflix is an incredibly disruptive company, and based on the way its stock has gone, the Quixter debacle aside, it's been very successful. This begs the question, how? And when I was researching this book, I came across an absolutely fascinating three-part data credo at Netflix certainly confirmed when I was there. The first part of which is that data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone at Netflix does not have access to employee salaries. But data is almost like oxygen, oxygen there. It's almost like a telephone. 
Netflix is tracking for its 48 million streaming customers every click, every selection, every pause. It knows when you leave a movie, it knows when you resume. For those of you who watch Netflix films on multiple devices, let's say you're on a train commuting home and you dial it up for five minutes on your iPhone and you come home and you want to watch it on your iPad. You don't really have to forward to the same spot. Netflix knows exactly where you let, left off. Amazon does as well if you read ebooks on multiple devices through Kindle. But forget staying within the enterprise. Forget the ridiculous amount of information that Netflix generates on its customers. The company does two more things that I think serve as very important lessons for everyone here today. The first of which is that the company purchases third-party data and metadata from firms like Nielsen. The, the company wants to understand its subscribers a bit more. Now think about why for a moment. Does anyone here not have a smartphone? Now some of you may be paying month to month, but most of you, I'd bet, are like me. I have a two-year contract with AT&T. If I want to get out of it, I'm going to have to pay or maybe get T-Mobile to pay for me. The point is there's friction. I can't leave very easily if I'm not satisfied. Is that true with Netflix? Absolutely not. Netflix is monthly. Same with something like Salesforce.com. So the business model supports using data to generate meaningful content for you. Right? It's very different than a contractual obligation. But Netflix does something else that I think is absolutely fascinating, and I came across it when I was researching the book. Does anyone know who Ray Kurzweil is? A couple people. I saw him speak a couple months ago in Vegas. I consider myself a pretty smart cookie, but that guy has forgotten more about technology than I will ever know. Very smart guy. And Kurzweil, in his book, The Singularity is Near, talks about how in the future humans will be able to think. People think he's crazy, but some of his predictions have been incredibly accurate. For instance, in 1990, he predicted that by 1999, a computer would beat the world's best chess player. He was wrong. It happened a year earlier than he thought. But right now, we're not at the point at which computers can understand everything. I saw Aaron slide them before. Uh, we're not quite there yet. But Netflix will pay people to watch movies. Now, this isn't simply a matter of, did you like the usual suspects? And how could you not? But what are the characteristics of those films, all films, really, that computers can't quantify? Netflix will train you for a week and have you grade movies on the basis of a number of different criteria. This allows Netflix to do some pretty scary things, one of which is the ability to move beyond simple genres. Anyone an Arrested Development fan? Huge fan. Right? There are certainly shows like comedies, like dramas, like westerns, like documentaries, right? But those are fairly broad. Netflix can and does go much deeper. In fact, researching the book, I came across this piece from The Hollywood Reporter. Netflix breaks its movies into 77,000 different subgenres, and they include, this is where it gets fun, dark, suspenseful sci-fi horror movies. OK, that seems to make sense. We also have gritty, suspenseful revenge westerns. Why is this not cooperating? There we go. Not to be confused with romantic Indian crime dramas. It gets better. Then there are evil kid horror movies. I'm thinking about the Chucky films. Visually striking, goofy action and adventure. And then, and this isn't a comprehensive list, this one's tough to say. Violent, suspenseful action and adventure movies from the 1980s. I guess that same subgenre exists from the 1970s. So Netflix generates an enormous amount of data. The second part of this three-part credo is that the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. Now, most companies today recognize that it's important to act very quickly. No one had heard of Justine Sacco until she tweeted, and then everyone had heard of Justine Sacco. If you haven't heard of her, Google her. Um, it was a pretty big mistake. But Netflix is one of those few companies that understands what its customers are doing as they're doing it. It's absolutely astonishing to me. But they don't just collect this data, they use it to inform many of their business decisions. Does anyone know who this is? Walter White. I mentioned before that I'm a huge fan of the show Breaking Bad. And for those of you who haven't seen the show, just a quick summary here. 
Walter White, played by Brian Cranston, is a high school chemistry teacher. He makes about $43,000 a year, works a second job as a car wash. He's 50 years old, his wife is 40, she's unexpectedly pregnant, and his teenage son has cerebral palsy. He finds out working at the car wash when he collapses that he has terminal lung cancer and very little time to live. He doesn't want to burden his family with a great deal of debt. So what do you do if you have nothing to lose and an acute knowledge of chemistry? Of course, you start manufacturing crystal meth. Now, why am I talking about Breaking Bad? Netflix knows some amazing things about its customers, and this is probably my favorite fact on them. For some reason, the slides are not advancing. Let me quit and relaunch, there we go. Are we good here? Okay, Netflix knows, for instance, that 50,000 of its customers, the day before season five premiered, watched all of season four. 50,000. They call it binge viewing. Now, each episode's around 40, 42 minutes. If you watch 13 in a row, people might think you're insane, and maybe you are, but watch Breaking Bad. It's that kind of show. When I meet people, and I really should have an affiliate link on my website, I tell people about it, and many times they'll tell me it's one in the morning, they have to put the kids to sleep, but they have to just watch one more, and then it ends and they have to do the same thing. But Netflix knows statistics like this, not just about Breaking Bad, Remember Netflix's core business model, they're paying $8 a month for as long as they want, with really no obligation beyond the next month. Ted Sarando ser serves as Netflix's chief content officer. Now, there's been a fair amount of title inflation, in my opinion, over the last 15, 20 years, but at Netflix, if you're the chief content officer, it's a very big job. Look at the P&L for Netflix. Their content acquisition costs, whether it's through original programming, like House of Cards, or licensing a show like Breaking Bad is actually worth billions of dollars a year. And a reporter asked Sorandos, the chief content officer, aren't you scared that, that customers will sign up for Netflix, binge watch all 13 episodes of House of Cards season one, and quit? And I found Sorandos' answer particularly interesting. And he said, only 8,000 of our customers did that. It wasn't, I don't know, I, I wish they don't do that. So they understood exactly what's going on. The third part of the credo is that Netflix understands whether a data set is small or large, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. Now, does anyone know who this is? Kevin Spacey, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, The Usual Suspects, Seven, and his Oscar award-winning performance for lead actor is Lester Burnham in American Beauty. His current project is House of Cards. Netflix dropped $100 million on this series without even seeing a pilot. That's unheard of in Hollywood. But again, Netflix had the data. And it could use that data to foster creativity. David Fincher from Fight Club fame directed the first two episodes of House of Cards. If you, on Netflix, gave one of Fincher's films a five-star rating, guess what? Netflix would play off that angle. If you didn't like Fincher's films, they wouldn't do that. So to me, this notion that data and creativity can't coexist, I think, is not exactly true. And Netflix still is taking a risk and dropping this kind of money on House of Cards, and this is the cover of it, but Netflix has the tools and uses them to make better business decisions. This is the cover of House of Cards. Kevin Spacey looks very authoritative on the show. He plays a very high up politician in the United States. I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen it. This is actually very similar to Macbeth with Patrick Stewart, which is not showing up. Murphy's Law. I'm wondering if I should just quit and relaunch this thing. There we go. Right? Now, these are very similar. They're both wearing white shirts. They're both about the same age. They're both white men. How similar? Netflix actually developed a tool that quantifies exactly how the colors relate to each other. And you can see that these covers are very similar. Perhaps you, like dramas that have black colors. Perhaps you like comedies with orange, and perhaps with you, there makes no, it makes no difference at all. The point is that Netflix uses the data to segment its customers as needed. And when you think about those 77,000 different subgenres, along with the colors, you come up to infinity pretty quickly. And Netflix is doing this with all of its movies. This is Arrested Development, I mentioned before, again, very yellow, very different than House of Cards and Hemlock Grows. And this feeds this Netflix data machine. Netflix knows what you're watching. It knows when you're watching. It knows the device 
on which you're watching. This isn't about 1998 and plugging it into your DVD player or watching it on your computer, right? We're talking about iPads, iPhones, Xboxes, myriad devices, and Netflix knows what you're watching and when. It also knows when you're pausing. Is there a specific point at which a movie bores you? If so, why? Does that feed their algorithm? Absolutely. So what, right? Big deal. In this book and in the previous book on big data, I talk about how he with the most data doesn't win. For some of my clients, they'll say, we already do big data. We have terabytes or petabytes of information. My question is always, that's wonderful. What do you do with it? Many of them can't answer that question. And I would argue that success in this era of big data hinges upon what organizations do with this information. As I said, with the possible exception of Amazon, no company understands its customers better than Netflix. This begs the question, what are some of the characteristics of a visual organization? Before I started writing and speaking, I did a great deal of consulting for my clients. And visual organizations, unlike some of my previous clients, eschew this notion of set it and forget it. In 2002, when I lived in New Jersey, I did some work for a large utility company. And to make a long story short, I built an access tool, Microsoft Access, that took data from point A, noodled with it, and sent it over to point B. Right? Five years after that, the company called me back and said, we're going through a system upgrade. So I go in, and they like me, and I saw a woman, and I was sort of squinting at her, she's squinting at me, and she said, you don't remember me, you developed this tool for us. I said, okay, does it still work, and do you use it? She said, yes and yes. Ain't broke, don't fix it, I get it. That's very different than visual organizations. They're constantly adding new sources of information, like I mentioned before with Netflix. Two, three years ago, many companies started to get their arms around social data. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and then Pinterest comes around, and many people would say to me, I, do I need to worry about this? It's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Short answer is yes. If you look at Pinterest engagements numbers, they're off the chart. These companies also encourage data discovery and exploration. Yes, dashboards, KPIs, analytics certainly matter, and they're not going away. But I argue in this book that interactive data visualization tools allow people to ask questions of data. You may discover things, as I write in the book, that you didn't even know existed. We're talking about not necessarily where, knowing where you're going. You can't tell me that at Netflix, they knew that in advance, quantifying the cover imagery on their content would matter, and if so, how much. Netflix believes in the power of data, and they put their money where their mouth is. They also, as I mentioned before with the marketing, don't look at it as an either-or situation. They're willing to make bets, they're, not, they're hardly certain, but because they're more competent with those bets, I would argue those are better business decisions, but don't make, it, don't make the mistake of thinking that there's no risk involved. These companies will buy and build new tools as necessary. I'm pretty sure that you can't walk into a Best Buy and buy a movie quantification package. Netflix built it, they thought that it mattered. Here are a few lessons from the book, and if we have time, hopefully we can do a question or two. But big data does not obviate the need for creativity. Again, look at them as complements, not substitutes. And one of my favorite book quotes researching the book was from Jim Barksdale, who has founded a bunch of companies like Net, Netscape. And the quote is, we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. Very true. Data threatens quite a few people. In my career as a consultant, I've run across many people who said, quite frankly, I don't need the data to tell me what's going on. Now, if you run a small business like I do, I can tell you right now my top three customers. I wish I had big data. Uh, but why? There are ways, I think, that big companies can ask better questions using data and data visualization. It's also important to experiment. You can't tell me that these companies like Netflix, like Amazon, like Google, know how things are going to play out. But they believe in the power of data. This is the 13th talk that I've done on the book. And some of the feedback I got early on was about companies like Netflix. And quite frankly, people are scared. They say, well, wait a minute. We're a small company, a small agency. We can not even dream of doing what Netflix can do. Fair point, but here's the rub. Five years ago, Netflix can't do what it can do today. And in five years, Netflix will do things today that they, that they cannot do. So think of it more as a journey. You don't go from zero to Google or zero to Netflix overnight. It's also important to avoid what I call the quarterly visualization mentality. At far too many companies, in my experience, people only visualize data at the end of the quarter, the end of the year. They have to prepare for some annual report. At visual organizations, people are constantly playing with data. They're constantly saying, well, what if we did this? Or they're looking at different things. They also understand that all data is not required to begin. 
You're never going to have all the big data. Again, that should never dissuade you. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. 